All right, well, um, then let's get started. Uh, thank you all um, uh, for being here as part of this event. And um, uh, we're very excited to continue the conversation. It's been a great conversation so far today. The, the title of this session is, Can We Democratize Data? And so we actually met before and decided, yes, so we're all good on that. No, just kidding. Um, no, this is a very important uh, and, and interesting question, right? Because you could kind of pick apart each of those four words. Maybe, well, can we probably could agree on. But who the we is, when we think about democratizing data, what does democratize mean? I mean, that's, there's a whole day in and of itself. And then what is data, right? So we've hit on, I mean, at least I felt as an audience member, we've hit on a number of these kind of questions already of, um, you know, especially uh, in the last session, I was particularly excited to hear more about our different conceptualizations of the we, like, you know, who are the, especially like connected to like who, whose data, who's doing the work, how do we think about accountability, a lot of these questions. I think we'll revisit some of those um, in, this, uh, in this session as well. Um, but also I think uh, thinking about um, even to some degree, if it's possible, uh, the political uh, implications of doing the work too uh, is going to be really interesting. So, we're just going to we're just going to go in order, and I've asked each of the panelists just to introduce themselves uh, to give you a sense of who they are and, and of the work, and then I'll make a few comments, and then we'll go to Q and A. Um, by the way, I'm Professor Jason Schultz, as you can probably tell here. I teach here uh, in the law school. I run a technology law and policy clinic where we focus on social justice, public interest, and technology concerns, and the students who work for me uh, do work on pro bono work on behalf of advocacy and organizations and individuals in these spaces um, as part of their training here, uh, similar to the work that Meg and others do in their clinics uh, in their issues. So with that, I'll turn it over to David and we'll go from there. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's my first time at NYU Law and one of the first times I've been on a law school panel since I'm not a lawyer didn't go to law school, but uh, find myself at the center of one of the most interesting data rights questions of the moment through my lawsuit uh, against Cambridge Ana Analytica in the UK. But a little bit about me, I am uh, an associate professor of media design just up the street at Parsons, the art and design division of the new school. And um, I actually was recently introduced to Sukti through a co colleague from the New School who's here, N N Nitin Swani, who we needed a guest at the class that I teach at Parsons called Dark Data to talk about Aadhaar. We had a unit on that. And so then I uh, found myself here at this conference to tell my story about trying to repatriate my voter data from the most con controversial data company in history to date, perhaps, Cambridge Analytica, a name that became a household name uh, last spring when um, The Guardian and The New York Times uh, published the whistleblower story about the company. Um, interestingly, that team, uh, The New York Times and Carol Cadwallader, the reporter from The Observer, were finalists for the Pulitzer Prize that was just announced this week as well. And indeed, the word Cambridge Analytica continues to resonate around the world because it was an international company. And it now becomes a sort of like shorthand for data bad guys or doing bad things with data. But a lot of people don't understand what it is and what it means and what are the implications around it. So I've been trying to find the answers to the questions that everybody has related to this company, which is how did they get our data? What did they do with it? Who did they share it with? And do we have a right to opt out? Those are very simple questions that people have had who have been looking at this company long before it was global headline news. In fact, it was on the radar for many, many years because the parent co company has been around for decades called SCL, um, which stands for, used, used to stand for Strategic Communications Laboratories and was really a um, post 9-11 PSYOPs co company that did work in the sort of hearts and minds work for um, go governments and uh, po politicians. Um, what part of its business model at first was to do election ma management 
for politicians and then once in power would then get uh, government contracts. Uh, so we had this interesting business model of uh, manipulating electorates to then uh, pr sort of practice more corruption. Um, but it was a government vendor. So the story began, um, I was interested in the general topic because I teach students at Parsons who are going into the tech and media and advertising industry, so trying to learn what this industry is. And during the primaries, we were trying to figure out how the technology of advertising, particularly ad tech, uh, was being used by campaigns. And um, a trade group uh, graded all the primary c candidates on their security and privacy practices, and most of the candidates failed the report card. But one campaign was sort of at the bottom of the heap, and that was the Cruz campaign, and that prompted us to look deeper into, so why did they get a failing grade? And it's because they had the most aggressive data harvesting tactics. And it turned out that Cambridge Analytica was one of their campaign vendors, and this was widely reported at the time. Uh, then in um, uh, uh, the end of 2015, The Guardian reported um, how the data was being amassed, and it, it was the first time that we, uh, the public, knew that there were concerns that the data was being harvested from Facebook, and that would be against uh, Facebook policy and potentially against the law. So uh, after the election of 2016 and the aftermath and shock of that, um, I mustered the courage with the advice of a Swiss mathematician and data protection advocate expert named Paul Olivier de Hay, who had already succeeded at using European uh, data protection laws, even before the GDPR, to get his data from uh, especially tech companies, companies like Uber, Adobe, uh, and many others, and had also pr 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 prompted the idea that Cambridge Analytica would have to abide by <coughs> data requests, what's called the subject access request. And so he convinced me to do that. And so in January of 2017, I submitted my subject access request. Um, I went to a, a website at cambridgeanalytica.org I filled out my information, and I immediately received an email from SCL Group, uh, which was the, the tr troubling government defense contractor. Uh, and they asked me to supply identity validation, which was uh, my driver's license and a con ed bill to prove my identity and residency, as well as a 10 pound fee that was to be paid to a company called SCL Elections Limited. So immediately, we see evidence that these companies are not what they appear to be, and that they are based in the United Kingdom. And this is not a United States entity that worked in the US elections. So on one hand, that was horrifying to me, deeply offensive to the notion of what democracy is supposed to be, and represented a startling shift in political technology, that it was an internationalized and even militarized in industry now. And a simple request of the data already started to lead us down that road. Uh, I received the data, or some data, in March. I received a PDF a letter from Cambridge Analytica stating it was trying to be compliant with the UK Data Protection Act of 1998 and trying to abide by the subject access request. They provided an Excel spreadsheet which contained uh, accurate voter registration information and uh, a history of my participation in all the elections and those outcomes, and then a political model of my political beliefs, meaning an ideological um, ranking of topics, as well as my propensity to participate, and potentially any difference between my registered partisanship and a computed partisanship. And the list of topics was very bizarre and difficult to understand. Uh, the most peculiar thing about the topics is that it ranked gun rights for me, the third most important issue to me, which was baffling because I don't consider that to be my political belief. But even more so troubling was that if they used demographic data alone to make that prediction, it wouldn't make sense because a 
Brooklyn dad in zip code 11231, the chance of that uh, sort of de demographic character ranking gun rights above education, and I'm a professor, um, just was, just <laughs> didn't make any sense. And then the um, sort of uh, social issues, sort of social justice category was ranked even lower. And here I am finding myself a data rights advocate. So it did not predict my political beliefs very well. But it didn't matter because my solicitor told me that it was all unlawful. That it was unlawful not to fully disclose the subject access request, so not to answer those questions. Where did they get the data? Who did they share it with? How did they process it? So their response was completely inadequate to the Data Protection Act Section 7 requirements of disclosure. And it is unlawful to create political models of people without their knowledge or consent in the United Kingdom. So the very political profiling itself was unlawful according to the UK Data Protection Act. This is a fact that has eluded the press to, to this day. There has never been a serious news report that US voters were illegally profiled according to UK law, that the company was an unlawful operation. The, all the hype was that Facebook data was misappropriated. We like, have learned every synonym for stealing. We've heard purloined, misappropriated, we've heard um, improperly used, improperly obtained, all of it a red herring to the unlawful pr profiling. And of course the debate over psychometrics and whether or not that even works was even more of a red herring to the actual unlawful activity. Very unfortunate. So in July, on July 4th, 2017, and in no coincidence, I filed a complaint with the Information Commissioner's Office about our concerns about the subject access request. Basically, why is the British government military contractor interfering in my democracy? And um, that complaint led to eventually an enforcement order being issued by the information commissioner demanding the company to comply with section seven of the UK DPA. The company ignored the request, refused to cooperate, and in January was criminally prosecuted and convicted for ignoring the enforcement order. So the only criminal conviction of Cambridge Analytica that probably will ever occur, occurred in the UK courts because of my complaint to the regulator. And if I hadn't done that, there would be no criminal prosecution of the company at all. And it proved that they refused to cooperate with the authorities. In December of, um, so sorry, let me rewind a little bit. So October of 2017, I announced a crowdfunding campaign on crowd justice with an intent to file a claim against the company for its DPA violations. Uh, and then I filed that claim on March 16th of 2018, which was the day of the headlines cr cr crashing. So essentially, I filed the claim. That evening, Facebook tried to get ahead of the story and said they were suspending and banning Cambridge Analytica. And then that weekend, the stories dropped in The Times, in The Guardian, and the Channel 4 undercover videos showing the um, heads of Cambridge Analytica engaged in um, the dark arts, let's say. We will, we will, that, that's not about data protection, so we'll, we'll just leave, leave that hanging over, over there. Um, so the, um, the claim then, of course, was put under moratorium when the companies filed for insolvency. And so we were not able to pursue that claim because when the company filed for insolvency in the UK and bankruptcy in the US, um, then we could not pursue that. Uh, however, after learning the fine points of English data protection law, it was time to learn the fine points, oh, without a degree, uh, it was time to learn the fine points of English insolvency law. Because now there was the opportunity to, we had tested the notion of data sovereignty. That is, if your data is processed in a country that has data protection rights, you can exercise those rights. The regulator will support you. 
citizenship is not relevant, and the Information Commissioner Elizabeth Denham uh, stated uh, in Parliament when asked by the Investigating Select Committee, specifically about my case, why does the Information Commissioner have jurisdiction? She replied, the subject access request proved that his data was processed in the UK by a registered data controller, therefore I have your jurisdiction. The law does not stipulate citizenship exclusion. And in fact, I learned later that the UK.gov website even says foreign nationals can perform subject access requests if their data was processed in the UK. Simple as that. So what we could not prove the extent of that sovereignty because of the moratorium, but we did show that the regulator was willing to cr criminally prosecute violators of the enforcement actions. So we came close, but the insolvency itself was an effective tactic, technique to evade accountability. We then challenged the insolvency itself by suing them in business court and um, I won a disclosure um, application in December of 2018. Uh, the administrators were refusing to cooperate and give me the um, documents that I was entitled to as an outstanding claimant. We received those uh, documents, so I sort of won that dis disclosure. And then, of course, I got thousands of documents um, in preparation for the trial, which occurred last month, March 18th, in business court where we tried to argue that the administrators of Cambridge Analytica and SCL uh, had exhibited a bias against me. And the law was that if you could demonstrate um, the appearance of bias, that that could lead to a remedy. The remedy in this case would be that the companies would be taken from the administrators and assigned to the state receivership and then potentially the Secretary of State could assign a new administrator to liquidate the companies. And the, the ev evidence that we presented uh, were things like the various ways that the administrators uh, did not treat me like a cr creditor or any of us who had um, uh, outstanding claims. We were trying to establish the idea of being a data creditor, uh, that if you have data rights that are unfulfilled and a company goes out of business, shouldn't you be tr treated like a financial creditor? Are there any reporters here? No, because I'm about to, Everyone. oh yeah? <laughs> From where? <laughs> yeah. I used to be a journalist. Okay, but you're not like from, it. okay, so <laughs> I was gonna say I'm about to break news, so, um, so that's why. Um, Everyone pull out your phone. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, so, but it's not good, good news. No. It's bad news. Um, I, the, the, the judgment has come down, and I lost the case. So uh, it means that um, the administrators were appointed as liquidators, and Cambridge Analytica and SCL will proceed through liquidation, and we will never get answers to the questions. We will never be able to recover our data, and over 200 million U.S. voters could have exercised their rights in the UK courts. Uh, we are exploring the chance of appeal, but the judge was extremely biased against me. Uh, he did not appreciate at all uh, the attempt to secure data rights. He treated the company as just any old company li liquidating, not a company at the center of multiple investigations around the world. In the United States alone, it is a subject of the Mueller investigation, FTC, SEC, the New York, um, the Washington DC Attorney General la la lawsuit, uh, investor la lawsuits against the company, this is just in the US. So a, um, a very deeply disappointing outcome, uh, I am now on the hook for costs, which is terrifying. And um, we have unfortunately shown that the legal system is really for the rich. And when individuals take private action and crowdfund, and uh, you know, I probably had well over a million pounds worth of legal support on contingency from the barristers that cost 800 pounds an hour and city firms that are unimaginably expensive. 
And so what was interesting from a kind of valuation standpoint is that my data went from being worth nothing to 10 pounds when I had to pay 10 pounds to get it back. And then it was probably worth millions of dollars once all of the legal assets were put up against it uh, to try and recover it. Um, but in the end, uh, insolvency court was not the place to get this victory. And the judge did not want to set the precedent that data creditorship is a thing. But unfortunately, I deeply believe that data creditorship is absolutely a thing that needs to be instituted because the Cambridge Analytica story now shows us that a company can abuse data at massive scales, get caught, go to business, get away with it. All right. So, <clears throat> turning to Sarah, do you want to go ahead? Tough act to follow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, so good afternoon. Now for something slightly different. Um, how do I get the slide presentation up? Um, so while that's coming up, uh, so my name is uh, Sarah Davis, but I'm mostly known by my middle name, which is Meg. Uh, and I'm uh, an anthropologist and uh, actually from New York. Thank you. From uh, grew up in Jamaica, Queens, um, and now uh, live in Geneva, Switzerland, which is a very small town that claims to manage the health of the world. Um, home of global health agencies, global finance agencies that invest billions every year, every year in uh, low-income countries and middle-income countries, uh, to, especially to combat HIV, TB, and malaria. So I'm here to speak a little bit about uh, this book that I've been working on and to share some of the key things I've been finding. You've been hearing a little bit from Peter and Jane and from John Waters about key population size estimates, um, and here's another take on that issue, looking at it from the angle of global targets that are set in Geneva, set in New York, and over which countries don't have so much say, and over what happens when you try to meet those targets. So um, basically where we start from is in 2016, UN member states approved the Sustainable Development Goals, very uh, utopian goals, including a goal to end HIV by 2030, and set indicators and targets in order to monitor progress in 140, 190 countries uh, towards that goal. And the joint UN program on HIV and AIDS, UN AIDS, showed that this could be done using mathematical models if you drastically scale up antiretroviral treatment and you get 90% of people estimated to be living with HIV to test and know their status, 90% of those who are, are test positive to start antiretroviral treatment, and 90% of those who start treatment to stay on it long enough to achieve viral suppression, which is when you get to the point where the virus can no longer be detected in your bloodstream and you're no longer able to transmit the virus to others. So these were the 90-90-90 goals. And what you see here is one of the very simple f forms of mathematical modeling that was done to show this was possible. And the red dots show if we continued uh, treatment coverage at the level that it existed in 2015, uh, escalating HIV infections to a point where it would become no longer feasible to fund treatment for all the people who need it. And if you rapidly scale up treatment in all the countries that are low income and middle income countries, you would drop HIV, uh, infections would drop uh, precipitously and the epidemic would become controllable. But the challenge is reaching this first 90 right here, getting people to test for HIV. And why is it so hard to reach 90% of people living uh, with HIV to, to test for HIV? Many, many people are very reluctant to take the HIV test, and this is because there's widespread stigma and discrimination. We were talking uh, at lunch with someone who was describing some of that experience. You have the risk in many countries of losing your job under the law, of being prosecuted for HIV transmission, of losing your home, of social rejection, uh, and it's an extremely difficult thing to do. So this is a picture from a report done by Asia Catalyst, which is an NGO I founded some years ago. Uh, working with networks of people living with HIV in four countries in Asia, and they documented denial of services by healthcare clinics against people living with HIV, um, additional fees, forced discharge, segregation, quarantine, sterilization, forcible sterilization of women living with HIV, and many other abuses. And the people most vulnerable to this are the key populations you've heard about a few times today already. Uh, the sex workers, gay men and other men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, and transgender people, especially trans women. 
Uh, many countries criminalize same-sex sexuality. Most countries criminalize sex work in some form. Most countries criminalize drug use, even for personal use. And most do not recognize a legal change of gender identity. So if you are outed as being a key population, you have the risk of facing police abuse, additional discrimination, extortion, vigilante violence, and more. Um, but, and if I had more time, I would show you this more specifically. If you pull apart the mathematical models that showed that scaling up treatment would work to end the AIDS epidemic, they don't talk about this. They don't include this in the variables. They don't quantify discrimination. They don't quantify uh, how people are, are unable to access services. They're idealized abstractions that show a very optimistic view of the world in which it's possible just to invest in a lot of commodities and end the AIDS epidemic. Um, but in practice, what we know, and you've heard a bit about this from Peter and John and others, is not just to have beautiful clinics stocked with, stocked with the best treatment, which of course is also a great thing to have, you need to invest in community support. You need to invest in peer outreach workers and in community empowerment and people knowing their rights. But there's very little money for that, and it's never uh, costed or quantified in the mathematical models that make the case for scale up. So nonetheless, countries are, are forging ahead to try to reach 90, 90, 90. And you see here one of the maps from PEPFAR, the US, uh, which is the global uh, HIV financing mechanism, PEPFAR. So they finance donors to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but all the countries that have high burden of HIV. And they're pushing those countries to do what you see in this little map of uh, Eastern Cape of South Africa, target the hotspots, figure out where key populations are located, where are the areas of highest HIV transmission, and invest in resources in those areas to target the money where it's most needed. Countries are now being asked to submit investment cases, very uh, for-profit sounding, submit investment cases to donors that lay out their picture of here's the epidemiological data, here's how we're gonna target the money and be strategic and have the biggest bang for the buck. And there's a whole other political economy discussion we could have about the pressure on the US donors, the pressure on the UK to scale up quickly so that in, you know, 2030 comes, we've ended HIV, whatever that means, and we no longer need to fund it anymore. So that's really the kind of underlying narrative that nobody talks about, but I, I suspect is the driving force behind this 90-90-90 push. So the big uh, indicator that I want to just quickly focus on is the key population size estimate, which you heard a bit about earlier. Um, key population size estimate is an estimate of the number of key populations in a given country. And once you have that, that's the bottom of the triangle, you can then figure out what's the coverage, how many people have tested for HIV, how many of those populations are accessing treatment, and how many have achieved viral suppression. But unfortunately, most countries lack this data. So this is a map from UNAIDS showing the countries that have reported estimates of the numbers of men who have sex with men. And as you can see, it's, it's not even most countries. It's a relatively small number of countries that have that information. Uh, one study of 140 countries found that fewer than 100 had size estimates for even one key population group. So what we're looking at here is a map of de data deserts, a map of areas where data is missing and where people are hidden. And for some populations, it's especially abysmal. So for transgender women lost in the data desert, 19% uh, is uh, UNAIDS estimate of HIV prevalence among trans women globally. That's probably an underestimate. It's one in five trans women living with HIV. But only 33 countries have ever reported size estimates for trans women to UNAIDS, which means approximately 160 countries that have no data whatsoever on transgender women. And we can assume that most of the countries that don't have data also don't have services. So for trans women, this is an apocalyptic set of numbers. So a study that I did while I was here as a visiting fellow with some uh, NYU students looked at whether we could find a clear association between laws that criminalize key populations and the HIV outcomes. And so we found, because there was a lot of data on men who have sex with men, not as much data on others, we were able to find that there was a clear association uh, between laws that criminalize same-sex sexuality and implausibly low size estimates for men who have sex with men. What we did is each of these little blue uh, boxes represents a country, and across the bottom of the X spectrum here you have uh, MSM size estimates as a proportion of the whole uh, male population in each country. And the countries that have, uh, do not criminalize same-sex sexualities have larger MSM size estimates. Those that do criminalize have smaller size estimates. And on the top, you see the ones that impose the death penalty, which have minuscule size estimates for men who have sex with men because they're very sensibly hiding. So this is not a huge surprise to find this, but it was nice to be able to quantify it. What was more surprising 
was that the countries that had low MSM size estimates and that criminalize uh, actually uh, were reporting very, very high HIV testing coverage. And when we started to look at it, we looked at the, the countries that are reporting over 90% HIV testing coverage among MSM, and we started reaching out to LGBT activists in those countries and UNAIDS offices, and like, what's going on? How is Algeria reach, uh, reaching 97.5% of men who have sex with men with HIV tests? It turned out Nigeria had a size estimate of 59 men who have sex with men, 57 of whom picked up their HIV tests, and therefore 97.5% coverage. <laughs> Hungary had 100% coverage because they tested 300 men. So there you go. 300 men who have sex with men, 100% tested, got their test results. Victory, right? We've got 100% coverage. So what happens is in contexts where people are criminalized, they're in hiding, you get lower size estimates, and it makes it look like the country is being successful when in fact it's actually failing. So how does this then play out in terms of resource allocations? Uh, well, a lot of countries are being asked now to use cost-effectiveness analysis software, which to me is like the ultimate neo neoliberal move. But it's very sensible in a way because if you have a limited bucket of funding, cost-effectiveness analysis helps you to figure out where you can get the biggest bang for the buck. So in this software, you basically use epidemiological data to group populations into small subpopulations, such as stable heterosexual couples, injecting drug users, female sex workers and their clients, et cetera. Then you input uh, your national targets, if you're an HIV uh, program officer, and then the software generates charts so that you can compare different scenarios. Like if we put a lot of money into harm reduction, then the HIV infection rates among injecting drug users go down, but maybe it goes up with another population. So what winds up happening is you have these different colored bars going up and down depending on which population you're investing the money in, which in, in essence pits the different populations against one another in a race for very limited resources. Um, so populations with very small numbers, such as MSM in Algeria, uh, injecting drug users in Nigeria, or uh, female sex workers in some other countries, investing in those populations is not going to be cost effective because they don't have the numbers to enable them to compete effectively with larger populations. And what was interesting is the tools don't even list some key populations as an option. So there's no uh, entry for transgender women. You can enter trans women manually, but they're not presented as an option. Male sex workers are also not presented as an option. And I interviewed uh, some of the designers behind the software and I said, why don't you, you know, why aren't they in there? And they said, well, most countries don't have data on those populations. Um, so uh, the tools appear neutral, right? The data appears neutral, but the political context in which the data is gathered and which the tools are used is, is not neutral. And this to me is the ultimate in neoliberalism. You have winners and losers among groups who are marginalized and who have historically uh, been discriminated against. Uh, so the last piece of this is to look at one of the actual investment cases, right? So countries create these investment cases and submit them to donors to make the case for how they're going to spend their uh, development aid. So this is a, a fragment of the investment case from Eswatini, the country formerly known as Swaziland, southern African country of about 1.3 million people, has the highest HIV prevalence in the world. And what's exciting about this investment case in certain respects is it's represents some progress, that female sex workers in the past had been left behind, very high HIV prevalence, and now here there's a little bit of money allocated towards their needs. Uh, men who have sex with men also recognized and, and there's some money invested for them. But the, the yellow lines here represent the populations that are zeros uh, because there's no data and so no allocation for injecting drug users or male sex workers, and transgender people are not even listed in the investment case. So this gives us kind of a sense then of the data paradox that exists for key populations. Negation and denialism and criminalization creates lack of data or lack of accurate data, uh, which then means that population is not prioritized, which means lack of resources for services that could save their lives, which then reinforces the lack of data. And so groups that have experienced historical discrimination are caught in this spiral of inequality that just keeps reinforcing itself. The hopeful piece of this is the kind of work that's being done by groups like Ishtar MSM in uh, Kenya and by uh, CVC in the Caribbean. So I had the opportunity to tag along with CVC as they were doing their key population size estimation study. And what was really exciting about this was how they positioned the community activists in the center of the process 
So the groups that had been unfunded and were almost dormant began to come back to life and began to build relationships with government officials and to build uh, you know, some credibility and some knowledge about the, the extent of the epidemic. So it wasn't just gathering data, it was very much, to my mind, a community empowerment process in which data was a tool to mobilize different social forces and align them and position them to work together. And to me, this opens up the possibility that instead of setting global health targets in Geneva or in Washington or in Brussels or somewhere else, they could be set from the community level with communities and municipal governments, local authorities working together to identify targets, hold each other accountable for progress, and then build those up to a national and global level so we have targets that we can all actually get behind. So, thank you. Finally seated. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks to the Bernstein Institute, to Sukti and Brian, and all of the other um, warm and friendly hosts for today's and tomorrow's event. Um, I'd like to also thank my co panelists and moderator um, and my team, my comrades at Our Data Bodies, and to all of the um, community members that um, have shared their stories and insights with us over the past three plus years. Um, my name is Sita Pena Gingadaran. I, um, uh, I, was, I, I, I grew up just 30 miles from here. Um, I was born to a Filipino mother and a South Indian father, and uh, various things took me down a path to do um, what I and others have called uh, research justice organizing. Um, I'm now based at the London School of Economics and um, it's nice to be home, I guess. Um, as uh, for those of you that were here earlier and heard um, Tawana Petty speak, uh, I, we're a part of the Our Data Bodies project. I'm one-fifth of the team. Um, in addition to Tawana, there's Tamika Lewis, who was working with the Center for Community Transitions in Charlotte, North Carolina. Manila Saba, who's with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Um, and we have a representative, Hamid Khan, who's um, from the coalition, who will be speaking tomorrow. Um, and Kim Reynolds, who's a master's student based at the University of Cape Town. Um, as Tawana shared, our data bodies, or ODB for short, has been collecting stories from more than 135 uh, individuals living in Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles uh, since 2016. And I want to continue some of the conversation that opened up earlier um, in relation to ODB uh, data collection and data-driven systems by focusing on the concept of refusal. This is refusal to be subjugated, to be dominated, to be oppressed, as I think some of our post-colonial thinkers have um, gotten us to think about. And refusal means perpetual reinvention, including a type of reinvention or self and collective recreation that can be messy and disaggregated. It can also be organized, um, but it, it, it's a spectrum. And people like Ruha Benjamin, who's at Princeton, have taken up this concept uh, of refusal in the context of science and technology studies to note the plurality of techniques that individuals and communities use to challenge technical and expert systems. And I think this term is really important and captures the spirit of some of what we've been discovering in Los Angeles, in Charlotte, in Detroit. Um, Yes, as Tawana um, alluded to, data collection or surveillance, uh, marginalizing surveillance and the data collection related to that creates a culture of fear, of suspicion amongst individuals. Yes, data-driven technologies or data-driven decision-making tears families and communities apart. Yes, pervasive data collection targeting and profiling can obliterate mental wellness and creates lasting and even intergenerational trauma. And yet, yes, people have developed strategies and tactics within these conditions of marginality. And while it might be appropriate to share and kind of 
pre uh, typology of the strategies and tactics. Um, I just want to go over a few of them in, in generalities, partly because I think it's up to communities to own these strategies and tactics and keep it within the communities, um, partly to guard, safeguard against co-optation. Though I would argue that refusal or focusing and privileging this idea of refusal is probably one of the more difficult things to co-opt when we're talking about how to deal and challenge data-driven systems. So people we've spoken with talk about expunging their records, um, correcting incorrect criminal background data, weaving their way through uh, complex city um, tax records to rectify how their properties have been classified, um, trying, to, trying out different digital security tools to protect themselves online, refusing to give up social security numbers, names, or other personal information to different actors, be they in the welfare system or um, law enforcement. There are forms of refusal that are also not about data or data-driven systems. Um, but about documenting abuses that relate to these technologies, right? The sort of socio-technical apparatus that surrounds them. So that might be photographing squalid conditions in a women's shelter and reporting that to a homeless or a coalition of civil rights and housing um, at the Community Action, uh, at Los Angeles Community Action Network, or about human connection, care, and love, including, in very basic terms, sharing one's experiences in confronting um, these dehumanizing systems, as well as redistributing the resources that one has in one's precarious life, right? So distributing food on the street um, that one finds from dumpster diving. As Marco, an unhoused Latino living in on the streets in Los Angeles said, it is important sometimes for us to also take stock and to recognize that even if we are the poorest and the least protective, protected, even if we have made the worst mistakes, we have the right, the opportunity to love ourselves because also we have to, we have to keep our spirits up. Refusal is powerful because it's about vision. And people have incredible visions about what ought to change in society, in the law, between people, even in themselves. This is anything from figuring out how to match. They're, they're very, in the interviews that we did, there are very concrete suggestions that people have to very transformative visions, right? So these range from people wanting to figure out how to match unhoused individuals with vacant properties being identified by the city. It's a brilliant idea. To creating agreements between returning citizens, i.e. ex-offenders, and employers and halfway houses about data sharing that would protect people as they're re-entering society. To designing community consultations that are ongoing and meaningful rather than just performative when talking about data collection and data use, all the way to transforming capitalism. Refusal is also powerful because it puts the burden on institutions to transform themselves and not the other way around, right? Once you have a community, a collective of people saying, well, actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to follow the rules that you've set forth with me. I'm not going to buy into this coercive, carceral, technological system. It starts to force institutions to pay attention in different ways. And if I'm on the street and I'm figuring out how to avoid systems that supposedly are created to help me, and yet they rob me of my dignity, and I don't want to be part of those systems. It should be up to those institutions to change, to humanize themselves, not for me to consent or give up my rights 
and be part of these dehumanizing, or to, to further dehumanize myself, subject myself to dehumanization. Historically, refusal is not the first thing that people talk about in these so-called critical discussions about technologies and data-driven systems, and especially in mainstream uh, conversations about data governance, where people are thinking about legal and ethical ramifications of data-driven systems. This mainstream work, I think, tends to draw our attention to design and engineering requirements for making technologies democratic. Yes, technologies should and can be made democratic, but the argument, I think, is improperly focused and improperly privileged. It's one that, I think, um, supports or legitimates a status quo system of elite decision makers and technical experts. So when we say we need to democratize technology by making the tech industry or those who manage and create these data-driven systems more diverse, more inclusive, I think that's taking away from those communities and those individuals who have said, actually, we want something different. We don't want these technologies to be in our lives. We don't want them to be an extension of systems of racism, systems of sexism, of classism, and so forth. That argument is a status quo preserving argument. And yet it's the one that's getting the most airplay. And I think it's really dangerous to think that we can solely depend on the goodwill of privileged engineers or designers, or furthermore, the elite institutions that support them. Rather, <laughs> rather data and data-driven technologies require that we acknowledge the importance of refusal by members of marginalized groups and of any individual or any community that is frustrated and oppressed by these systems, right? When we acknowledge the importance of refusal, I think we do a service to our democratic institutions and to the idea of democracy. But without that, we're at a loss. So until we really invest in creating the spaces and acknowledging the value of refusal, we're still gonna be supporting that same status quo. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, three very interesting and, and powerful presentations from different perspectives. Um, so I'm only going, I'm going to ask maybe a few questions, but if those of you in the audience want to think about sort of what you want to add to the conversation, I, I welcome you to um, think about that as well. One of the things that struck me um, about each of your presentations um, is thinking about time. And so like there are time frames to what we're talking about here that are sometimes I think challenging to think about. So some, David, some of the data that gets collected, right, in these databases, say Cambridge Analytica, but there are dozens or hundreds of these companies who've been acquiring data for a very long time, many of them from public data sets, right? <clears throat> it's, it's almost, uh, you know, one of the challenges is thinking of like, what are the timeframes of accountability for, I mean, we could maybe focus on Cambridge Analytica specifically, right? But there are many actors in the space. There are many partners and data brokers. I mean, Facebook, obviously, as you said, got a lot of attention there. But um, you know, that's one example of like not only do we think about who are the, the actors in the kind of you know relationships, but over what time period. And um, Meg, it struck me that we, you know we're thinking about health data, right? And and the data deserts. And it's like so you know, do we think about these? Problem. I mean, I guess 2030 gives us a time frame to think about it. But I'm, I, you know, I'm going to ask each of you to maybe comment on the right, on the maybe not right, but on the ways that you think about time frames, right? And Sita, you were talking about this, and I mean, again, I think you know your point about the dominance of the tech industries in promoting a narrative that all we need to do is fix their problems, not actually have any agency in choices, right? I mean, 
Are there time frames that each of you think about for how we move forward in these conversations? Um, or is that a useful way to think about it? Like, do we, should we be thinking about 12 months, 12 years, or is this just an ongoing everyday kind of a thing? I'm just trying to think about like, how the work and the progress is going to um, proceed. Um, so I don't know if any of you want to jump in, but like, if you think about time frames of doing this work, um, are they useful, are they not useful, and if, in what ways? Do you want me to start? So, in the case of elections, the time frames are the sort of lead up to the election and then the consequence of the election, and that reverberates. In the case of electing presidents and lawmakers, obviously it's like their impact that reverberates, but interestingly in the case of, of the United Kingdom, where the referendum to leave the EU was also part of the scandal and controversy of data abuse and misuse, and many of the campaigns have been fined and punished by the authorities for breaking data protection law related to Brexit, um, that Brexit itself is tainted by data misuse, and it is permanent. So the effects of these things vary, but in the case of the the life cycle of the data itself, um, just from a technical standpoint, it's collecting the voter files and enriching them with commercial data brokerage. And so it's really the blending of public and commercial and other unknown data sources together and the combination of then deploying that into the advertising and media ecosystem. So there's also a, an idea of like our behaviors generate our commercial and political identities, and those identities are then fed back into the surveillance capitalism system that we are participating in. Me next, or you? Go ahead, okay. Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question because uh, global health governance happens at the speed of light sometimes. You know, you're making these huge decisions about allocations and funding for countries, approval of grants, and having done some work with uh, civil society groups that engage with and try to influence how money in those countries, in their countries, is gonna be allocated, they're almost always finding out about the opportunity to influence after it's passed, right? So there's, there's some nominal, like, uh, we're gonna consult with stakeholders and we're gonna get their inputs, and then, you know, actually when uh, things come around, it's actually, you know, the, the decision's already been made because you weren't fast enough and you didn't know what was happening in Geneva or Washington. And so I think there's this kind of a dislocation of time that always means that civil society groups are always kind of trying to catch up with a train that's already left the station that just further reinforces the marginalization that makes it really difficult to, to have meaningful input. And that's why I think, you know, the discussion that happened this morning about slowing down processes is really important because you might not be able to slow down that pace, but, but having a, a timeline for resistance in which you think sort of strategically and long-term about how to engage and how to mobilize uh, might then create, you know, some momentum to, to put the brakes on the system globally. I don't know. There, there, I feel like there are a lot of mini questions embedded in that question. <laughs> Um, you can just pick one. Yes, yes. But, uh, you know, I think that we started off the day um, acknowledging the Lenape Indians. And, you know, my honest answer is we're on ancestral time, <laughs> right? Um, and that's a really different clock than a legal clock or, um, you know, a research clock or a governance clock. And I think it's important to acknowledge that because, um, again, in elite decision-making institutions, and that's not just the tech industry, that's actually the whole collection of think tanks and multi-stakeholder governance institutions that focus on data and AI and algorithmic systems and all of that, right? Until we think in terms of the time of justice, I, I'm not sure that, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with Jody. We do have to slow things down, if not just purely stop them. And I'll just say one more thing really quickly. Um, you know, 
in doing this work, so I came to this work um, both as a researcher and as an organizer. I just happened to be at a university and I'm like the nerdy abstract person, so that's an okay place for me to be. And I wanna say in doing this work with our data bodies, um, I've really come to appreciate some of the conversations and teachings and learnings that I've encountered around a conversation of abolition. And that really makes me think about time in a different way, that this is an ongoing struggle, this is much longer than me, this is much longer than our data bodies or the work that we do individually and collectively with our institutions, right? This is an intergenerational struggle. And I have my comrades at our data bodies and the organizations that um, they come from, the communities that they come from, to thank for that. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, some of you might know there's a task force here in New York City that's trying to look at automated decision systems, algorithmic systems that are used inside the New York City government. And one of the things that just came out is that the task force, which has a legal deadline of December 2019 to issue a report, um, has kind of hit some obstacles about getting the access to the information they need. And it's interesting because some people's reaction is, oh no, now we need to speed up. And other people's reaction is, wait a minute, that means that we need to slow down and take a deeper look at the kind of political problems or other kinds of problems blocking us from getting to where we need to go. And so, yeah, no, I think it's interesting to say, like, whose time frame are we on and what are, what's driving the time frame, right? It's really interesting. Um, one last question, and, and we'll go to, then to the audience is, um, I think that in struggles for social justice, there's always either explicitly or implicitly a question about um, who is the we and then who are the allies. Um, and I just wondered if any of you wanted to talk about uh, allies in your struggles, who, like, or is everybody part of the we? Or are there different roles um, in these struggles that you think are important to highlight? I'd love to hear David go first. <laughs> um, I have allies around the world. It's good to know that. Um, I raised crowdfunding money um, from people around the world, m mostly about half US and half UK citizens. I have tried to be a voice on social media, Twitter in particular, and the uh, response that I get to the things that I say, I get constant validation that there are a lot of people who care about these issues and are willing to go deep into the weeds on them. And um, the participation in the law of it all has been fascinating to me because I myself am not a lawyer and didn't know about any of this. I didn't know the difference between a solicitor and a barrister before I started this. Um, and uh, just the way that sort of the democratization of the issues around data, that if Cambridge Analytica has done anything, it has woken us up to these issues. It has been the cataclysmic moment of realizing what can go wrong and the worst case scenario played out before our very eyes. So there are a lot of people who are just in, into that. But in terms of specific allies, it would be you know, someone like Paul Olivier de Hay, who, who pioneered the idea that you could get your data from these companies and then force them to hand it over and then dispute the completeness of it. And then, of course, um, the QCs and my solicitor, Rahavi Naik, um, you know, have donated massive amounts of talent and money toward this effort. So, of course, I have to thank them. Um, so I just want to read something really quickly that comes from one of our interim reports from our data bodies, which was published in July of 2018. Um, so we talk about, um, we say, our data bodies was born from previous research and organizing in and around data profiling, data-driven technologies, resistance to surveillance, and digital justice. We grew from a set of shared interests. We wanted to shift who gets to define problems around data collection, data privacy, and data security from elites to impacted communities. So 
when we're talking about the we, we're specifically talking about marginal members of marginalized communities and the organizations and the collection of coalitions and networks and you know, ad hoc groups and people that come together in support of these communities and their struggles. Now, part of the reason why I said, David, I want to hear you go first, is because earlier today, Tawana talked about one of these activities that comes from our digital defense playbook, this what's in your wallet. And um, if you recall, one of the things that she mentioned is it's something that everyone can do, right? Every, anyone can pick up and, and empty out the contents of their wallet and recognize, like, oh, there, you know, the, there are different forms of data that, we're, that are collected about me, and they're integrated into all different types of systems, and they're speaking to one another. And that's kind of like, oh, a universal recognition that, like, the kinds of frustration that comes with being ensnared and trapped and coerced into participating in data-driven technological systems is something that affects everyone. And when I was hearing you tell your story about like all the details of going through this process, right? You're talking about um, a resource intensive process um, that dwarfs, I think, what we've heard about um, in, I think, I've never heard of anybody doing this. So yeah, it's like a crazy outlier. But when we've learned and talked to people um, about what they're doing to access their data. They're talking about a very similar thing, right? Mm -hmm. They haven't given up, right? They haven't given up. We haven't given up on the fact that people are extracting data from us and there's something we can do about that. So in that sense, yes, we come from, and this work comes from a very specific historical location, right? And it, and surveillance and data profiling and um, privacy problems affect vulnerable communities in very distinct um, ways as compared to an average middle class consumer. But there are similar similarities that can be drawn and I think that's really important to draw out. Yeah, I think a really interesting question and um, I appreciate having had a couple minutes to think about it and not having to go first on this. Um, what's really interesting for me about, as a longtime participant and observer of the, the AIDS activism movement, is how it uh, has grown to become this huge global phenomenon and is now under pressure to declare itself, declare victory, and, and allow us all to move on, while there's still a lot of people living with HIV and very high rates of HIV infection globally. Um, but nonetheless, there's a big pressure now in, uh, by the donors to, who have funded the global HIV response to integrate it into universal health coverage and to now focus on integrating HIV into other health responses. And there's a lot of really sensible reasons for this, but there's also a lot of fear that because we haven't addressed the underlying structural issues and the discrimination and so forth that we'll just go right back to where we began. Um, but what I think is exciting about this kind of merging of the HIV activism and the HIV response with other health uh, responses is the opportunity it creates for AIDS activism to share lessons that have been learned over the past 20, 30 years of mobilization and response. And you know, it, it started with a bunch of people who were being written off who then turned themselves into medical experts and got themselves onto reviewing uh, trials of medicines and, and you know, built up this hu huge infrastructure. And it showed that you can um, build from communities that have uneven access to education and people can become experts and, and occupy roles that govern uh, huge global health institutions. So the board of the Global Fund, the board of UNAIDS, um, the board of Gavi, the board of Unitaid, all include people living with HIV, uh, all include representatives of key populations, and they exercise you know, not as much power as I would like, but they exercise a fair amount of power. And so I think that sets a precedent that we have to keep and we have to expand on. And so I think when we think about who the allies are, how can we do that with other diseases? How can we do that with other movements to ensure that that kind of community representation and authority is entrenched and institutionalized in ways that make it much harder to eliminate? Thank you. All right, well, let's open it up um, to questions, comments. I want to just extend Jason's uh, question a little further regarding allies because we may find allies in unconventional places, um, 
many of these tech companies, including Google and Amazon, have had many employees who have protested these data policies and have had huge impact internally. I spoke at Google a couple of months ago, and I applauded those employees to come forward at great risk to themselves. And um, I think they need allies, including many of these communities. And I think it's a horizontal relationship to develop between industry activists and community activists to do the right thing. Uh, because you know they want to find ways of talking about these issues within their own companies and take the risks that are necessary to, to disclose them. Many of them, like Chelsea Manning and Edward Snowden and others, have given up a lot to do that. Um, but I think um, we have to find ways to work with the tech sector uh, and perhaps in, invite them to do workshops with community groups and think about these issues critically together uh, because it, we can't just solve this from the grassroots. We've got to figure out how to work with these allies and these larger startups as well. So I just wondered about that uh, as an issue, uh, how you would address that and go forward with that tactically. I'll try and keep my story quick. But um, so in terms of allies, one of the groups that I, I hope that we can ally with is um, the Open Markets Institute. And I mention them really specifically because they remind me of a story that, so after Barry Lynn, who was at New America, um, celebrated a case against, a settlement against Google <coughs> that came from, I think, the competition, yes, um, at the EU, uh, basically fining Google for uh, quite a bit of money. Um, Barry Lynn then celebrated this and basically got fired from New America. Um, and Barry and the rest of the people at Open Markets are um, real big advocates of you know, having consumer choice and breaking up monopolies and things like that. And I think those are the people that we'd like to ally with that are at that you know, kind of, if there are uh, sort of elite institutions that we'd like to ally with, I would say like, let's go there. I think the tech companies are harder, and part of this relates to my personal experience after that event, which is I got a phone call from Google saying, we want to partner with you. Um, we're, we love your research. We're really interested in it, and <laughs> we want to um, do something together. We want you to write a white paper with us about how data collection and data-driven technologies are impacting marginalized communities. And I was like, what? This is, these are a, I mean, whoever is managing your PR strategy is totally off base here. But B, like, what could be a more disingenuous way to engage communities, right? And so I, I am really deeply mistrustful of what's happening with these big companies. What's happening with the workers, I think, is important, but one slice of how these companies are managed and how they're run, right? I'd rather have a conversation with undergraduates at Stanford University that are thinking about getting a very lucrative job at any one of the big five tech companies rather than engaging with um, workers in the institutions themselves. Uh, great. Can everybody hear me? Wonderful. Uh, my name is Katie Mayle, and I work at the Center for Reproductive Rights, and I have both a comment and a question. Uh, Meg, during your presentation, I was struck by the similarities that we see in the reproductive rights movement around the undercounting of women dying from unsafe abortion because of restrictive laws and policies, and also the inability to count the women who are safely inducing abortion themselves using medical abortion pills, um, also because it generally is not um, legally enabled. Um, under the law. So my question, though, is a little bit separate from that. I think I was struck by the geographic disconnect um, within the chains of accountability um, in both David and uh, Meg's um, discussion. Um, and so thinking about where David had to seek accountability through the British justice system, and Meg, where you're thinking about marginalized populations trying to seek accountability from UN agencies, which they're completely geographically disconnected from. 
And I guess I was wondering if you both could just reflect on how do we keep um, populations that might be um, activated and that are really politically engaged around a whole range of different issues, how do we keep them engaged around data, which I think can often seem really abstract to um, populations that are you know, dealing with a range of different um, issues kind of on their plates. Do you want to go, Meg? Go ahead. Um, so the reason why I had no recourse in the United States because we don't have the same idea of data protection as a fundamental human right. So the EU Charter makes data protection a fundamental human right. Therefore, they don't use the word privacy. They use the word data protection because privacy is a pretty meaningless term that is defined by tech companies. Whenever you read a privacy policy, you say, we care about your privacy. They never define the term. And so whereas data protection, you either have it or you don't. And then there are fundamental human rights that undergird it. So in the, where we are in the United States right now is we have states pursuing privacy and data protection laws, California leading that, other states considering it, and the industry is freaking out and wants to get a, pre a preemption in place.